Hello everyone, I'm nobody of particular importance, and this is the introduction and part one of the story running title, Knights of the Round Table. Now, originally I started doing a lot of reading on Arthurian legends, and originally I simply thought that it would help inform my own writing. However, what I found was actually much more interesting than I had imagined. The truth of the matter is that the historical King Arthur, if he existed at all, probably existed sometime in the 4th or 5th century, and was likely a king or lord from Wales, actually, that was probably simply quite popular at the time, and likely known as a great warrior. The legends surrounding this man gradually started to appropriate the myths and legends of others around from the British Isles. For example, some believe that the origins of the sword Excalibur actually lie with an Irish legendary hero who wields a sword which, th which would make rainbows when swung and had the power to cut the tops off hills. However, to be honest, which parts of the legend may or may not come from one place or another are less important. What is significant is who wrote the different parts of the legends and when. Most of the legends that our culture is now familiar with, stories of uh, Guinevere and Lancelot, the Holy Grail, and stories of various knights were actually written centuries later than the original mentioning of Arthur. For example, Lancelot himself was actually only first introduced some eight centuries later during a poem, Lancelot, the Knight of the Cart, and was in fact written by a French poet, not a British one. Indeed, he was actually at the time known as Lance du Lac. I'm not sure if that's the appropriate pronunciation, but this translates as Lance of the Lake, due to the fact that he was raised by the Lady of the Lake. This was later altered to Lancelot, but for this story, he will be known as Lance of the Lake. And, as you may find out, he probably would hate the name Lancelot, but I won't spoil that. It turns out that pretty much everything that the lay person knows of King Arthur and the court of Camelot, to the introduction of the round table, to the knights that sat around it, was actually written many centuries later, and mostly by French poets. There are many tales of the exploits of knights of the round table, the legend of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, for example, or his brother, Sir Gareth, and his rescue of the Lady Lenore. By the way, um, the Black Knight in Monty Python was a reference to Sir Gareth's tale. But all of these tales are, again, written up to, or even more than a millennia after the first mention of Arthur. In these cases, Various writers have taken the idea of King Arthur, rewritten it, introduced their own characters and storylines, even writing about the death of Arthur himself and what happens afterwards. In this way, one can't really say what is or isn't true or canon in the story of King Arthur, because the majority of legends are closer to fan fiction than anything else, and even the modern adaptations are really just as valid as anything else. So... This series is going to be a modern interpretation of King Arthur that is absolutely not canon, because none of it is. I will be taking various legends, characters, and storylines that I believe to be compelling and adapting them for modern sensibilities, basically meaning that I'm not going to have Arthur have Gwen executed for cheating on him and things like that. I will be following the stories of a number of prominent knights of the Round Table through arcs that have already been written some centuries ago only with minor changes to the plot, and try to give each arc a satisfying conclusion and a bit of a moral, if I can. Even if the moral is not to make deals with supernatural knights in green. I will be basing the actual story in a way that is designed to allow each of the knights, while already familiar with one another, to be introduced to the reader, or in this case listener, a few at a time. You may notice, as I'm not going to be terribly subtle about it, that a number of the knights will be female, when their original writer had written them as male. Rest assured that I'm not doing this in a kind of fate anime series reason where the characters are female for the sake of waifu. If you're not familiar with the term, then well done you. Rather, while reading up on the legend, I noticed that, particularly with many of the French written characters, they were often described as being particularly feminine. In Galahad and Gareth's cases in particular, it is noted that these characters appeared particularly androgynous, to the point that many weren't sure of what their sex might be at all. It is my opinion, and of course it could not be proven as such, 
but it is my opinion that the writers had intended to write female characters, but the times had not allowed them to do so. Hence, Galahad and Gareth will be female in this story, along with a few other characters to make their arcs more interesting, and to be honest, one of them is just female to round out the numbers, and because I think the character would be cooler as a woman. Let me just remind you that essentially, all Arthurian legends are basically fan fiction. Century old fan fiction. So there's no real need to take them too seriously. The main change that I've made is the character of King Arthur himself. In many interpretations in the past, King Arthur is a wise and great king, by the standards of the time. This may mean executing his wife for adultery, waging war on heathens, or in general not being a very nice person by today's standards. In this interpretation, Arthur is the weakest of all of the knights, but an incredibly knowledgeable leader, using his intelligence and strategy to overcome obstacles rather than brute strength of his own. I'm doing this because if Arthur were simply a perfect knight with a magic sword, then there would be barely any reason for him to have an entire order of diverse knights. I will make little use of the sword Excalibur. Instead, Arthur will be making use of the first object he was ever associated with, the shield Pridwin, from the earliest of legends, long before mentioning of a magic sword. His counterpart, Lance of the Lake, is a swordsman that has never been defeated. Raised by the Lady of the Lake, he has always been aware that his life has been guided by destiny, and that said destiny is entwined with the fate of Arthur. This destiny, he later becomes aware, does not belong to him. Together, he and Arthur lead the knights as two sides of the same coin. But the story isn't about them, but another. The theme of this series is there are many ways to be strong. Without further ado, part one, prologue. You disgrace me, child. The father glares down at me, my sword, broken, lying in the dirt beside me. The Pendragon line is one of warrior kings, not of mewling cowards. His great armoured boot drives into my shoulder, sending my body reeling across the field. You disgrace your name. He shoves his sword into the ground, casting off his gauntlets. Just as I am able to raise my bloodshot eyes to him, he has already drawn me up with one great hand around my throat. You disgrace yourself. His voice doesn't waver. He isn't even angry, nor frustrated. His voice is the same as it ever was. Look at me. He tosses me aside. So little effort it takes him that he doesn't even grunt or exclaim in exhaustion. <laughs> Pathetic. I know. This isn't the first beating I've taken. The Prince of Camelot can't swing a sword. Everyone knows. Sir Kay likes nothing better than to humiliate me in the training ground under the pretense of training. But that's okay. I've learned a lot from that woman. Indelicate though she is. My left arm hangs limp in my shining armour, which, I point out, I polish myself, unlike some. I'm just a failure, I scoff. Why, all the other kings must make fun of you to no end having a son like me. I find myself chortling in the man's face, then laughing, and finally cackling like a moron. Pain does that to me. Indeed. The man's face doesn't change at all, splattered as it is with my own blood after he broke my nose. But no more, he states. He reaches out to me. I'll have you disgrace us no more. I take one step back, my foot hitting the box that I had placed there last night. Perfect. No. <laughs> I suppose not, I grin. He steps towards me. His mighty form leaves only three steps between us. His heavy boot slams down on the soft soil, digging in inches with every step. I'd promised myself that I'd keep a straight face. Half the kingdom has turned up for this day. The day they all knew was coming. The day that I challenged my father one last time. They'd come to witness his resolve. They'd come to see him kill me with his bare hands. 
not after today. He had so hardened his heart. I remember a time when he was gentle with me, until I was old enough to practice with a sword, and he saw my future. He trudges forward one last time. He had thrown me out of the arena with his first strike. Of course he did. The lords and ladies of the land watched on coldly as I was swatted about the muddy field. That's fine. Mother and those few that I call friends wept at the sidelines. That, that is not fun. His boot heel hits the ground, and so it gives way. The muddy earth, barely bound by the grass that I have replaced over my crap, gives way as the fragile wooden frame snaps under his weight. Last night's rain was just the thing to render the shovel marks invisible once more. There is a collective gasp as the man, from their perspective, simply ceases to exist. The man himself doesn't make a sound until he reaches the bottom. Ah! Uh, I roar. Uh, <coughs> Um, I mean, I composed myself. After all, all the lords of the surrounding lands had followed us out of the arena, probably hoping to see Father pop my head like a grape. Uh, oh no! <laughs> who, who put that there? I scoff. <laughs> I'm hilarious. And pretty low on blood, I add to myself. You! The hole bellows. Give me a moment, Father. I have uh, to do something. I cough. Rather not insignificant amount of blood up. I fetch the box that I had placed here last night. <coughs> which um, <coughs> would have been easier had I both working arms. I scramble down and sit at the edge of the pit. It's very, very deep. I'm quite proud, actually. What have you done? The pit seems to bellow. Um, I dug a hole. Obviously. I even reinforced the sides with wood so it wouldn't, um... Yeah, but, um... Oh, don't try. There is a sharp snapping sound, followed by a really rather satisfying thud. Yeah, they won't be strong enough to hold you, is, is um... What I was going to say. I sigh. I peer over the side. Now. Now. His face has changed. I feel my eyes welling up. He hasn't been angry at me in so long. I just wasn't worth it. He just wanted rid of me. How's your leg there, father? I call down. My arm's just fine. Also my face. And my shin. I go ahead and assure him. How dare- Now, now, father, calm down. Just take a deep breath through the nose. Yes, that's the way. I taunt him. When I get out of here, what is that? Um, tar, pitch, animal fat, Latin oil, a few other things. I note, retrieving a water skin from the box. See, um, I was worried about the rain, so I put a bunch of them down there, just in case. I take the small knife from the box and pierce the skin, letting the contents splash down on the man that is now displaying more emotion on his face than I'd ever seen before. What? What are you doing? He reconsiders his tone. There he is at the bottom of a muddy, twelve-foot-deep pit. Honestly, I've really outdone myself with this. Forcing your surrender. I take the oil-soaked rag and place it on my knee. Thanks for leaving your sword, by the way. You might have climbed out if you had it. I scoff. I arrange the flint and steel on my knee and carefully try to get a spark going. I can see the eyes of those that had followed us over widening. Really wish I had both arms here. There we go. I bear out the edge of the flaming rag. <coughs> um, never done this before. Surrender! I do a frankly terrible impression of my father. Yield! I scoff. This is fun. I chortle to myself, trying to ignore the flashbacks of various times I've been ridiculed while defenseless. You! The man actually seems to consider his position once in his life. I will not. Also, keep in mind that if you burn to a crisp, then that, I guess, means I'll be king, I contemplate rather loudly. 
I don't look down at the man, but I can feel the heat of his rage. That'll probably ignite the oil bowl by itself. And you'll have left your kingdom in the hands of a weak child whose reign will probably be contested by all the lords here. And then Camelot will be plunged into civil war and your people will tear one another apart and... Arthur! He bellows. And it'll all be because the great Uther Pendragon, king of kings, mightiest of the mighty, fell in a hole filled with rancid pig fat. I scoff. Arthur! Well, I mean, it's not rancid, but I'm not going to tell them that. I shrug, testing to see if I can move my left arm. Nope. I think it's only one bone, but it's definitely broken. Got him back, though. Unless his leg usually does that. I don't think it usually does that. Yeah, I think I definitely got him back. And you'll basically be bacon, so you're not going to be telling them. Well, my arm's getting really tired here. Maybe I should just let go of this flaming rag and take a nap, I consider. You! He flourishes a massive finger at me accusingly. You won't do it, he accuses. Ha! <laughs> ah, of course not, I scoff. If I killed you, I'd be assassinated by the end of the week, I chortle. I dig a small hole with my elbow and shove the rag therein. I'm quite good at digging holes, turns out. I cover the flaming rag until it's completely extinguished. Ha! In the end, you couldn't even... Yeah! He winces as I toss a small stone down at him. <laughs> this is fun! I toss down some more. Suddenly I get why all the cousins always threw things at me. Arthur! Yeah, I'm bored. Also, I think I'm about to pass out. I scramble to my feet above the 12-foot pit. I measured. Have fun avoiding every sconce and candle on the way to the baths, father. Arthur! Get back here! He calls out to me. The sound of the anger in his voice seems to have changed. The sound of his disappointed, simply cold tone that's so familiar just isn't there. But something else. I don't quite recognize it. Actually, you know what? You know what? I turn on my heels. Sin since I have you here, I do, I do have one thing to say. I stare down my nose at the man, as he always has to me. You see, there are many ways to be strong, father. And you're only good at one of them. Chapter One And that was how I died. Morgana returned after all these years. She returned with her son, Mordred. He was only three years old last I saw him. Such a clever child, like his mother. Talented, even so young, such innate magical skill. I wonder if Morgana was the same when she was young. I was so pleased to see them again. I welcomed them into the keep, reminisced them with them about old times. I, w I bequeathed on dear Mordred my own first training sword and gave him his pick of the yearling colts in the stables. I admit that I was perhaps unjustly proud that he chose a young black colt with a white blaze almost identical to my first horse. I'm sure that was a coincidence, but I, I couldn't help but well up a little. He played with Galahad for a while. Gwaine played the part of a nasty troll for them to boldly defeat. We dined on the finest foods and drank the finest wines from Morgana and the attending nobles, that is. I, I only gave Mordred a slight sip. His cheeks immediately turned red. It was the first time... It was the first time all my closest knights had been there for what seems like years. As though a family reunion. There was singing and dancing and a not insignificant amount of falling over. Morgana and I caught up after dinner. We discussed the incongruities of Elven records and the libraries and lamented how people tend to exaggerate their own accomplishments, meaning that most of what is actually written down is hardly worth using. I admit that I was rather giddy the night through. Good friends, 
good food. Guinevere did a beautiful recital that she insists was her own composition on her new harp. It was beautiful. I know that she really did write it, of course. She's been trying incredibly hard. A girl her age shouldn't have that good of a work ethic. I definitely didn't cry, though. Not even a little. <coughs> Maybe a bit. Fine, I cried. Not made of stone. Really, though, five-year-olds should not know how chords work. I don't even know how chords work. Maybe she could teach me. Morgana and I stayed up for hours discussing the intricacies of elven magic. Not sure how we got on the topic. It turns out there are some major differences in our own magic and theirs that, as far as I can tell, tend to resolve of as much around semantics of their language and different cultural perspectives that are people just don't understand. I've learned a lot about magic. I'm not very good at it, aside from barrier magic, but I know a lot. Human magic tends to revolve around power, strength as far as combat goes, throwing balls of fire, throwing bigger balls of fire. It's all about more, more of this, more of that. Enchanted swords to cut better, making armor stronger, shields sturdier. The training that knights undergo tends to revolve around using magic to strengthen the body, concentrating on the person, the self, on skill. Faber was a master at using body strengthening and skin hardening magic. He didn't even use spells. Instead, his pure, strong, unwavering will worked in the same way. He used a great deal of magic as well, mostly fire, but his talent was in strength of body. His armor was nearly an inch thick. He was a mountain of a man, which only made stricking him that time all the easier. Mages and wizards from around the kingdoms tend to focus on magic that does a specific thing, to fill a specific need. Our magic is literal, tangible. Elves have an ancient, polytheistic religion entwined with spirits and perspectives of the world that I can't even approach understanding. Their magics work in ways that are nuanced, elaborate, functioning in ways that only those that truly understand the culture could ever understand. I found myself staring into the stars as we talked, coming to a deep realization that I know so very little about this world. I find myself cursing this mortal life. No matter how vast the Camelot Library is, no matter how much I learn, I will live and die never having known so much as a single percent of what this world has to offer. <coughs> anyway, it was... the company was lovely. It was good to simply talk with someone who shares my interests. Morgana is talented in magic beyond compare, except for the wizard Merlin, maybe, or, or the Lady of the Lake, I suppose. Beyond compare among humans, at least. Father said that a, a woman mage would never amount to more than a witch, selling poisons and trading souls with the devil. I get the feeling he was never troubled by his own ignorance, but for Morgana, magic flows off her in waves. I can, I can feel it when she walks into a room. I'd wager she could turn someone into both a frog and an ostrich at the same time. Not sure how that would work, but I'm, I'm sure she could do it. I've never seen an ostrich before. I bet they're great. <sighs> we didn't discuss our lives. We were too caught up contemplating the vagaries of the ether to even bring up the whole her raising a brilliantly talented young man and me attempting to raise a brilliant young kingdom. Also my ward, Gwen, of course. Her uncle was one of Uther's closest friends. I didn't like the man, but when he passed, of course I took her in. <laughs> Best thing I've ever done. It's like having a little, a little sister. I've always wanted a younger sibling, though... To inflict father on anyone would have been a travesty. I barely survived as it was. Morgana might be my half-sister, four years my senior, but she always lived with our eldest half-sister, Morgors. After all, father had murdered her father, raped in grain our mother, conceiving me. Mother became sick soon after my birth, bedridden, nearly unresponsive by the end. No wonder my siblings never came to visit. Morgana and I only met when I was ten and she was fourteen. Father had already become cold to me. She was kind and wise. 
She spoke of my mother with reverence. It was only then that I found out how I was conceived. Though she was, to me, a paragon of warmth, a hint of a family life I had never had, I could s always see the part of her that despised me, as though I represent everything that tore her once content family apart. We met a number of times after that. She grew into a beautiful woman, admired and feared as a sorceress. I gradually came to develop a personality myself, and she saw how different I was to my father, and, I like to think, we became friends. Soon after that, she introduced me to my nephews, our eldest sister's sons. Gwen, who was a few years older than Morgana, the twins, Gahavis and Gareth, two years my senior, and they all used to throw stones at me and make fun of my incompetence at combat. And now they are my closest family. To see her again, to simply talk, to drink, to see her eyeing some of my nights. <laughs> it was Lamorath, by the way. I won't tell Gawain and the twins about that. They can't stand the man for some reason. I found myself spoiling Mordred, secretly hoping that he might insist that they stay. That was selfish of me. Morgana doesn't like it here, after all. Too many bad memories of father. Morgana excused herself after the third time Mordred snuck out of his room and tried to join us. I hadn't realised just how exhausted I was. Morgana hadn't announced her visit, so as soon as I heard I was running around like a madman, arranging the feast, tracking down musicians, they all seemed to have gone missing for some reason, and sending Gareth out to find us a nice ball. Took her a whole half hour. She's slipping. As soon as I got to my room, I just fell onto the bed. I'm sure my maid, Joanna, undressed me because I woke up in my sleeping gown, but I honestly cannot remember. Somehow, one of my last thoughts was regretting not being able to do something nice for her, to reward her hard work. Merlin's Tower fell, the tallest tower in Camelot, in all the human realm, I believe, fell. The tower was not some magical aberration, nor sustained by the power of the wizard, nor innately magical. The tower, rising from the west wing of the keep towards the sky, had the deepest foundations of any building I know. There is no open area below it, unlike other towers which allow for a room beneath. And a heavily vaulted ceiling, Merlin's tower was one single massive stone structure, the walls incredibly thick, allowing for only a single claustrophobic, frankly terrifying spiral staircase rising towards the sky. Merlin even drove six giant steel pillars deep into the earth to further reinforce the tower, lest Camelot were to be sieged, and he felt like sleeping in. The tower fell, not sideways onto the town, nor sent tumbling off to the east and off the great steel cliffs and into the great lake below, but instead the entire tower simply fell into the earth, which simply shouldn't be possible. The earth shook. I thought the castle was going to fall apart, which it rather did. The city was filled with screams. I was shaken awake by Gareth. Joanna had stayed to assist me with my armour, and I sent her off with Gareth. I ordered the knights to evacuate the citizens as a priority. Little Gwen and Galahad refused to leave my side. I had to send Kay off with them under her arms. I was a fool. It took me so long to realise that Morgana was nowhere to be seen. But Mordred, Mordred was in the throne room, standing over the bodies of Martha and Callie, the two women who were tending him to bed. He was covered in blood, wielding a black blade, an eight-year-old soaked in blood. That look in his eyes. With a single flourish of the black blade, a great gash of stone was carved out of the wall, I fear we might not have survived if I didn't have Pridwin with me, which is why I always have my great shield, Pridwin, with me. Mordred simply gave us a mild look of frustration that we were not bisected and turned his attention upward, collapsing the stone ceiling. The women were dead. By the time we managed to move the stone, he was gone, as were the bodies. I heard Galahad and Gwen 
yelling from somewhere far away. They should be safe. My knights were around me, my brothers and sisters in arms. Gareth and Tristan reported that the populace was safe. Kay returned, having passed the children off to others. We were ready. No, we weren't. We weren't ready at all. Black tendrils of magic that I had never even heard of before were reaching outwards from Merlin's room that was now somehow at ground level. Lance and Lamorak rushed forward and were cast aside by a thrashing tentacle. Gwaine and Kay restrained the assaulting tentacles as Gaharis and Bedivere cut them down. Bors and Lionel charged in. Gareth and I countered the tongues of hellfire emerging from the tower room. The black tentacles disappeared. The hellfire died away. Morgana emerged, Mordred at her heel. The light was terrifying. I dashed forward, the strongest barrier I could muster, collapsed in an instant. And that was how I died, I assure the endless blue sky before me. That's how it works, after all. The strongest human mage I know, having pacified the great wizard Merlin, breaks my barrier in an instant. I reason. You die, I conclude. Right? I ask the clouds as they lazily roll across the sky. Which is why... Why it's such a lovely day. Because I'm dead, I continue. Right? Birds call happily in the trees around me. I recognize a few of the calls, but not all of their names. I used to know them all. When I was younger, I would record their calls. Hmm. There aren't any calls that I don't recognize. All of the calls are birds commonly found in Camelot. This breeze, this sky, this grass, they are all familiar to me. I hear the sound of water, a stream flowing nearby. It sounds nice. I bet it's nice and cool. It'd be fresh water. We've, we have such clear water here, so I don't even have to boil it. I could even catch a fish. That sounds lovely. Yep, dead. Th this is exactly what I was hoping the afterlife would be. I'm definitely dead. I think it's morning. Uh, maybe a little while before noon. If the afterlife was simply a eternal cool morning where I can fish and listen to birds, that, that would be wonderful. I do, however, have a few questions. One, why is my arm broken? Two, why is it always the same arm that breaks? Three, what, what's that ominous dark area in the sky to the west? Yes, yes, west. Four, does the afterlife usually include searing pain all over my body? That seems like a strange thing for the afterlife to have. Five. I'm not dead, am I? Uh, am I... Am I disappointed by that? Yes, yes I am. Sitting by a stream in an, I in an idyllic version of my home with singing birds around me for all eternity sounded lovely. Relaxing. Every time I took a trip... A uh, day off, I would leave my steward, Kay, in charge, always stressing that she would work with the others of the round table to deal with any problems. But no matter what, always when I got back there was at least one mess that I ended up having to clean up. Gaharis picking a fight with Lamorak. Gaharis being blacklisted from another brothel. Gaharis sleeping with someone he wasn't supposed to. I should probably think of something other than Gaharis, just to seem fair. Um, Lionel picking a fight at the bars? But, uh, Bors would usually deal with that, so, um... Well, apparently Gaharis is the bane of my existence. This is not a shock. <coughs> uh, well, there's only a little bit of red in my saliva. I'm sure that'll be fine. 
I lift myself up as slowly as possible. Partially because I'm in ridiculous pain, but mostly because I'm also strangely comfortable and I really don't feel like getting up. I appear to be in something of a hole, I narrate as I rise, glancing around me at this disturbed earth forming a rather me-shaped hole in the ground. So, this is what that feels like. (laughs) I scoff at the inferior few inches that I seem to be lying in. I've seen dogs dig better holes, I scoff. (laughs) Arthur, king of the pitfall. I muse to myself. Oh, hello there, Pridwen. I greet my shield, embedded deep in the earth beside me. Look at you, unscathed. I nod happily to myself. Excellent craftsmanship, I must say. I chortle to myself and drag myself to my knees. Pridwen is a shield that I made when I was around 17, I believe. I took everything that I knew about barrier magics, um, material strengthening magics and blacksmithing, and made a giant, ridiculously heavy metal wall with some big metal handholds riveted onto the back. It's inelegant, it's simply ugly. It's twice as heavy as it ought to be, but it works. I might have the worst sword arm around, no wonder the Lady of the Lake Orbit threw Excalibur at me, but I can keep an army at bay with this thing at my side. And have, by the way. Hang on a second. I get to my feet in a split... Oh, I should not have done that. Ugh, not spilling my legs. I collapse onto the, thankfully, very soft grass beside the me-shaped impact crater. Excalibur! Oh, there you are. I spot the shining hilt of the holy sword Excalibur in the... Oh, no. I crawl along the ground to get a better look. Again? I stare at the hilt with only a inch of steel protruding from it. Damn it! That woman is going to kill me. I lament, taking the pathetic, bladeless hilt. Well, if I'm not dead, the lady's gonna fix that. (sighs) I attempt a joke, only knowing that it really isn't much of a joke. I can spot flecks of reflected light around the impact crater, fragments of the blade, fragments of my armour, My chest plate hangs by a thin strip of metal. My greaves have all been turned off. Pridwin, of course, protected my head and vitals, but whatever that burst of magic was tore off any exposed metal. The impact broke my arm and singed off all my body hair. That's fine. I'm used to not having eyebrows all the time. (sighs) Never trust a combat mage with both eyebrows, by the way. They've clearly never tried anything interesting. (sighs) At this point, I'm wearing... About a large saucepan's worth of metal, most of which is currently bent and in places piercing my skin. However, the... And everyone thought it was a stupid idea to make a reinforced med kit out of steel and stiffened leather. But, well, I get hurt a lot, so it actually comes in very useful. The steel, scaled, rather fetching pouch is lying about ten metres over that way. And a bit down the slope that presumably leads to the stream that I'm just barely hearing over the ringing in my ears. The grass is so soft, the breeze is so nice. There is one bird whose call is grating at my brain, which is rather ruining the whole deal. I somehow want this scene to be perfect, so that I might justify simply lying here. I bet Geharis and that bird would get along. No, that's unfair. Harris would never associate with anything but the sweetest of songbirds. <sighs> Very well. If this bird will not allow me peace, then I shall return to the world. But I'm not happy about it. I shuffle down to my medical kit as slowly as I can justify to myself, removing the tatters of doublet and bent plates of armour as I go. I have the best first aid ma- magic that fits into a small pouch, at least of the magic that humans can supply. It's mostly just for patching myself up on and others on the way to better help, with some choice spells that, to be honest, I carry around specifically in case my arm breaks again. Pridwin might be close to unbreakable as it gets, but I'm not. I take the bandages from my kit and the marking chalk, which is mostly powder. 
The stream is clear and tranquil as I had pictured, trickling dr down through the field. It's somewhat unsettling how peaceful it is here. Unfortunately, there wouldn't be room to catch a fish, but the fresh water is exactly what I need right now. It's cool and sweet, and the stones here are just right for what I need. I find myself a smooth stone that looks to have been worn down somewhat when the stream is flowing stronger. I lever it away from the earth with one of the larger plates I was to discard. I give it a quick clean in the stream and dry it off with what was left of my almond goblet. I essentially paste on powder chalk around the now pleasantly smooth stone. It's a nice little trick that I learned from a uh, dwarven diplomatic party, actually. A few runes that I honestly can't read later, and I'm done. This spell is made for reducing stones down to powder, so that they can be used as ingredients for various things. I force my will into the stone, like stomping juice from grapes to make wine. Unlike human magic, where one breathes their energy into a spell, or an elf's magic, where one gives their energy to the wind, as I understand it. Not sure, the translations aren't fantastic. But the sorcerer of the dwarves, one named Garrick, said that when dealing with rock, one must be stronger than the rock. And so I force my will into the stone, as though I were to crush it with my bare hands. And so, it is crushed. The powder falls clearly into my chest plate, which will do for now as a sort of a bowl. The spell is simple. Depending on the amount of energy you put in, you it gives you a small amount of powder in proportion. So even if you're feeling drained like me, you can still give you a bit. Fortunately, I think I must have been sleeping in that crater for quite a while. While my body definitely isn't happy with me, I'm not bad on the mana side. I prepare some bandages, but I've already been prepared with the appropriate spells, and mix some water into the stone. Only one of the bones is broken, in my arm, that is. There's at least two ribs that aren't happy with me either, but that's less urgent. I place the cloth in my mouth and wrap the bandages up, just to the break. Why can't humans have three hands, by the way? Things would be so much easier like that. I pull out my on my ri- Oh, that, yep. <coughs> that's it. I clench my teeth. I force the break up and maneuver the bones into position. The swelling is terrible. The horrible grinding feeling inside makes you want to throw up, but but it's necessary. I've been in this position before. Six times, by my count. At least once by father's hand, and twice by his boot. I know where it needs to be. There. I let my energy flow into the bandages, breathing them to life. It will stiffen my muscles, holding the bone in place long enough. I wrap the rest of my wrist, and then lather on stone onto it. It's pleasantly cool. I firm the stone slurry up a bit and then force my will into the bandages again. This time, the dwarven spell activates as well, forcing the water out and binding the stone powder together to form a solid. With a few more layers and a little break to catch my breath and admire the scenery now that that bird has shut up, I've finished. A solid stone cast. Strong, strong enough to last until I find a proper healer, at least. Or so I hope. If it starts cracking, then I'll have to reinforce it, I suppose. Of course, last time I did this, I hadn't positioned the bones properly, and my physician, Hagar, had to break it again. That was not the best day. Well then, I sling Pridwin across my back, having, having fashioned something of a pouch with which to carry the fragments of Excalibur. I suppose it would be irresponsible to simply sleep by the stream and gorge on those blackberries forever, I sigh. <laughs> Not that there are any left. I'd planned to bring some with me, but, um, well, at least I'm full. Although I now have even more scratches than before. Good thing I brought so much of Gwen's marvellous selves with me. I face the ominous darkness in the sky. There's something dangerous that way. Something very, very powerful. I turn on my heels and face directly away from it. That way, I declare. I travel across country for hours. The sun sets, the last of the colours leave the sky. 
save for that place in the west which remains disturbingly illuminated with some kind of dark light. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but it's the only way that I can think of to describe it. I clamber over wooden fences, rotten, broken, attempt to leap streams, only to realise just how exhausted I am while in the air, and only hurt myself more. This is wrong. The landmarks. That's Prayer's Hill, which apparently looks like someone prostrating themselves in prayer. People go there all the time. There isn't a church or anything, but people will go there to pray and make offerings to the land. I've been there before, attended a, um, a sermon from a local druid priest trying to educate about the balance of the world. He wasn't getting mu much across, but he did teach me a few things. There was a lovely garden up there, maintained mostly by travellers, those on pilgrimages, and a lovely pool that seems to have formed naturally at the top. It wasn't a terribly sacred place, but but that didn't stop it from basically being a sacred place, if that makes sense. Also, the views up there are amazing, or they were. You used to be able to see the garden, but it's overgrown. Trees have grown up where it was, and when I last saw it, it was simply grass. As it stands, I can barely recognize the hill itself, but at least I know where I am now. If the hill is there, and the mountain of St. Albert is over there, then I must be around, I would say, 12 miles from Camelot. And Camelot, of course, would be right where that ominous light is coming from. I pause for a moment under a willow tree. <sighs> Morgana. Sister. I glance back, but the view of the sky is obscured. I hear a wolf. It's nearby. <sighs> what have we done? I can't rest here. I could set up a barrier to protect me from the wolves, but I get the feeling that using too much mana, mana here would be a bad idea. I carry on in the dark. This is my home. In truth, Camelot is the capital of the Kingdom of Logria, but it's not even our largest city. Yochland is. And Yochland should be about, say, seven miles to the southwest, I believe? It's near the centre of the kingdom and at the confluence of various paths of neighbouring kingdoms, so it is our largest trade town. But I'm not really that far from either city. There should be villages around here. Uh, Yabby, or maybe Ornard. <sighs> These fields I walk between should be farmland. I should be seen grazing animals. As it is, I'm pushing through overgrown grasses, shrubs and trees. There are wild animals. Deer. I can hear boar rustling around. I'm sure if Percival were here, he'd already be cooking one on the fire. Probably a boar. The man really loves boar. He'd be off on a quick errand to check on the Camelot City's outer defence, and somehow his version of reporting back is hiding near pig's hind quarters. I don't mind. It's always well cooked. I'm sure any of my knights would have somehow built a perfectly good camp by now, but I'm hardly an outdoorsman. So I'll keep walking. I really wish this wasn't full moon. The light is appreciated, but it is unsettling. Hello? I knock on a door to a small, two-story farm home. A few hours had passed, and I have travelled hopefully a few miles at least before I found some land that actually has been fenced and cultivated. Of course, of course, the last thing I wanted to do was climb that fence. I can hear the low noise of animals sleeping within. Hello? I knock again. The fields have been managed well, and it seems that people here are growing barley, assuming that I remember that correctly. I believe that these fields are nearly ready for harvest. Hello? I raise my voice somewhat. I feel a bit badly about it, but I would rather like the idea of not being eaten by wolves tonight. What sounds like a rather unhappy pig wakes up and starts making a fuss. Rather quickly, all the animals wake up and begin announcing their displeasure at being woken up at this hour. And then the sounds of people, who are also rather unhappy, join the animals. Uh, hello? I really, really am sorry to disturb you, I call out. Arthur, get a sword, a man calls from within. 
A small light blooms inside the house. Right, a younger sounding man responds. I don't think he means me, I conclude. I, uh, I'm going to take a step back. I take a few steps b away from the door. Who are ya? The upper window on the right side slams open and a man leans out, brandishing a crossbow. Hello. I give a meek wave. Sorry to disturb you. What's on ya? What are you doing out there? He pauses. He looks like he expected to see something else. Why aren't you wearing a shirt? Well, I was attacked, I admit. Well, of course you were, walking around by... By what you mean, you you were attacked, and and that's why you look. Yeah, okay, yep. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm still half asleep. All right. Well, what are you doing here then? He re-aims his crossbow. Well, I'm looking for help, I suppose. Honestly, I just started walking and thought, maybe help. Huh. The man considers this. Turn around, he says. His eyes narrow. His tone doesn't seem demanding so much as curious. Uh, I hesitate a moment. Pridwin is on my back, so I'm really more concerned about getting shot in the front. Okay. I go ahead and turn. That's... that's... Uh, you were wearing... Are you a knight or something? Um... Something. Yeah, yes, yes, I am. Yep, that's about right. That's... that can't be right. He rests his crossbow down, but doesn't put it away. Since when does a knight say sorry? Well, what I'd like to hope all of them would. I... really, if someone causes one an inconvenience, they should at least say sorry, shouldn't they? Huh. The man scoffs. He confers with someone inside. Right? He seems to agree with whomever he is talking to. My name's Freddy, he notes to me. You, um... Well, you don't look armed, but, well... He takes another moment to confer with someone inside. I'm gonna let you in, he points a finger. But, look, you don't look armed, but you, but you do look like a fighting man, and I got me a wife and me girl here, so my boy's gonna hold on to me sword... And if you try anything funny, he'll use the sword. He um, threatens me, I suppose. Well, that, yes, sense of precaution, I nod. I tell you what, why don't I leave um, Pridwin, my, um, I'll leave my shield here. And um, actually, I do have a little knife in my kit as well. I should leave that outside as well. I heft the layered slab of steel off my shoulder and sit it down beside the door. It sinks a fair bit into the earth. I then retrieve my little bandage cutter knife from my kit and leave it there as well. There we go. I present myself to, to the man. Alright. He nods. He takes a moment to give a careful look around the fields, perhaps in case I was not actually alone. Alright. Yep. Yeah. Give me a second. You sure? A voice behind the door questions. Well, no, not really. Freddy scoffs. But that's why you've got the sword, innit? He chortles to himself. I really do like this guy. All right, the man says, now behind the door. He releases from, by the sounds of it, several rather large latches. Now that I think about it, this is a very heavy-looking door for a farmhouse. Come on in. Here we go. Oh, wait, sorry. No, it's snagged again. Here we go. He pulls the door all the way open. There is a rather large black and pink pig staring at me from inside, not at all impressed with me interrupting its sleeping patterns. Thank you, good sir. I find myself grinning as I step in. I'm instantly overcome by the warmth and smell of the animals. Okay. I notice something else. It seems that there's a large reinforced brace that they had moved to open the door. That's not your standard keeping bandits out sort of a thing. That's a proper keeping something very nasty at bay while you sneak out the window sort of thing. Hello there. I greet the son. Presumably, Arthur. I would, um, shake your hand, but, uh, 
Mm, yeah, maybe not. The son shrugs as he holds the sword ready. It's a very, very old sword by the looks of it. It's been well maintained, polished, sharpened properly, and it looks like a new hilt has been improvised. But it looks perfectly serviceable enough. This is me boy, Arthur. <laughs> Dumb name. I scoff. Oi! Ha! I'm, I'm kidding. I'm also called Arthur. I chortle. A middle-aged woman stands on the stairs, eyeing me more curiously than suspiciously. A young man and a young woman peek down from the upper level. The young woman seems to be staring somewhat intensely, which is fair. If I were a young woman and a strange man, presumably a knight or noble, were to arrive at my house, I would be probably very scared. These people are likely serfs of a local lord, perhaps Adrian, who I'm relatively sure is a baron of this area. Since taking the throne, I've gradually been trying to phase out serfdom, but unfortunately I got blown up in the process. A young woman like this would belong to her lord. Were he to simply arrive one night, she would certainly be expected to make him comfortable, so to speak. Technically, actually, as overlord to Adrian, these people technically belong to me. That's rather unsettling. Ha <laughs> ha! The father laughs along. It's a good strong name. Well, I like to think so, yes. I partially agree. Um, nice to meet you. Um, I'm Arthur. I was wondering if I might rest here, if it's uh, not too much trouble. Of course, my lord. Um, I'm uh, Freddy, or Frederick. Uh, Freddy. Freddy's fine. Uh, this is my wife, Ulda. Uh, is my youngest, Charles, and my daughter, Cherry. Absolutely charmed, I say. And please, just, just call me Arthur. I'm relatively sure I'm not really a lord anymore, so... Well, you're a man of nobility, that's obvious. Freddy shrugs. And as long as you mean us no harm, he takes a moment to meet my eyes directly, then you're welcome in me own, he announces. Of course you are. The woman agrees, though she seems a little nervous. Why don't you come upstairs? I'll, I'll put on the stove. Charles, why don't you go and draw some water? She gives the young man a nudge. I, I am really very sorry for the disruption, I assure them all, particularly that pig. I step aside as Charles takes a pail and begrudgingly heads outside. I really wouldn't want to trouble you all, but I, well, I really am starving. Oh, now it's no trouble at all. She assures me. You just have a seat and... Now, 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 I, I, I know exactly how annoying it is to be woken up in the middle of the night. I interrupt. Which was rude. So I insist on paying you for your hospitality. Their home is very compact. Like many modern homes, it is built on two levels, because keeping wooden flooring dry is much easier when it's off the ground. So traditionally one keeps their animals inside on the bottom level. Not sure when human nations came up with that, but it, I guess it must have been after Camelot itself was founded and before Yockland was. The upper floor has two rooms, a kind of common area with a stove for cooking and boiling water and a place to prepare the food and eat. In the other room, I expect there would be personal effects and bedding, though it also looks like someone has been sleeping in the kitchen. The entire place smells like animals. I'm not used to the smell, but honestly, I find it strangely refreshing. It smells like actually earning one's money. Unlike most of the people I know. Nonsense! I won't hear of... I'll pay you a gold coin. I slide a coin out of my kit and brandish it in the man's direction. The room freezes. Farmers just don't deal in Logrian shields. When I took the throne... Logria was in a greatly advantageous position due to some advances in farming that I had admittedly stolen from the druids in the south. In my defence, they didn't technically say that I couldn't use their techniques. After I dealt with Uncle Alban's challenge, all the lords swore their fealty, which I had rather expected to be much more trouble than it was. I almost feel the need to thank Alban. Logria was untouchable. We were making allies from former enemies, and it had always been a tradition to mint a new coin with the king's visage. I had the new coins made 
to contain a quarter again as much gold as any other coins in the kingdom. It was a massive economical risk. If the new coins didn't catch the eye of merchants around the realm, all of our import and exportations would suffer. But we had more trade goods than ever. We flooded the realms with our new coins. No self-respecting merchant was ever seen using less valuable coins. It was a massive success. Even the counterfeit shields were worth more than a Gorian crown or a Lothian flame. This coin is the mark of my success as a king. Bearing the Pendragon coat of arms on one side, and my face, which looks rather more heroic there than in person, on the other. My father had his mighty blade, said to cut down a dragon in a single slash, which it had, at least twice, that identified him. He was known as the strongest king. But these coins mark me as the king that sold you all the discounted produce that let your people live through the winter. Have fun declaring war on that guy. Of course, King Claudius still did after what father did to him. Thanks, father. I really do like cleaning up your messes. That, he points at the coin. I'm holding it now so my own face is facing me, which is lucky because I hadn't thought of that. Now, see ya, Freddy sighs, stroking his temple. That, that would be more profit than we make in a year. And I expect at least a bale of straw to sleep on out of the deal, I scoff. In all seriousness, I actually have lost quite a bit of blood, and I'm rather concerned I might not live through the night without shelter, I admit. The room exchanges glances, then shrugs simultaneously. Seems like a good investment, I say. Hmm, Freddy sighs. Well, if I had to choose between probable death and paying a coin, I guess. He sighs. I just want to say, you're putting me in... I wouldn't accept payment for this, but... My family's going to be a lot better off if I accept. Honestly, just take the coin. I'll feel better. You'll all be better off. And the fact that all your possessions are packed and your fields are ready to be harvested, I'm guessing you're all about to leave anyway. So, how about we call this, um... Me wishing you well for a new, happy life, wherever it is you're moving to, I state. The room, other than the youngest boy trudging back into the house, is very still. Well, Holder speaks up, when you put it like that, she is quite well spoken, or at least being very polite. She strides over and takes the coin both graciously and rather quickly, so that I might not change my mind, and snatches it down her top. I'd best prepare a goat, then, she supposes. Cherry, heat up some water for our guest, eh? Oh, no, I, I really couldn't deprive you of your livestock, particularly right now. <sighs> well, if you insist on being difficult, the woman sighs. I really do like you guys, I scoff. I can do you some boiled swede, bit of dried goat, Holder proposes. Her husband and children watch on. Rather impressed with her. That sounds lovely, I admit. They aren't convinced. Honestly, I've had nothing but wild berries, and um, now that I think back on it, I'm not sure they were quite as ripe as I thought they were, I sigh. Their attention shifts to their eldest son, Arthur. Oh, hey now, that was, that was only one time. Five, by my count, Cherry sighs. Go help your brother with the door, Hulda scoffs, striking her flint and steel, trying to get the stove going. Not sure I like it, Frederick scowls down at the hot greenish fluid. It's a kind of um, unfermented tea from Yarathai, an elven nation in the east. I'm not sure I like it either, I admit. Wait, I thought, don't they ferment things so they're better? Well, that's what I said, yes, but... For some reason, all the fancy types are crazy for it. Apparently it's really good for you? Wait, is is not fermenting things make it be- Wait, so does then fermenting things make it worse? Freddy asks. Does that mean beer ain't good for you? <laughs> it does me some good, I'll tell you that for nothing. I scoff. Hey, 
right there with you, mate. Frederick, cheers. Now, how do you, uh... Oh, there you go. Hopefully something will fit you. He notes as his son places down a small selection of linen tunics. Now, uh, how'd you get all... You know, he mimes a kind of... How did you get half your torso to be missing most of its skin, sort of a thing. Um, run in with a nasty mage, I note. Which was actually the truth. The room suddenly freezes. It, um... It wasn't... Her... Was it? Freddy glares around the room, checking each window. Her, her, no, 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 um, no, um, yes, it, it rather was actually. Um, no, I was just um further to the west. As soon as I mention west, the family begins exchanging glances, as though I'm some kind of moron. And this um, I assume mercenary mage. I lie. Young Arthur nods, as though this is something to be expected. Um, didn't really take kindly to me. I figured I'd be alright, but there was a second one. Um, got me completely by surprise. Blasted me, uh, you know, and now I'm... Now, I'm a, uh, a really a specialist, you know, um, a barrier specialist. But somehow I was, well, just bloody soaring through the air all of a sudden. I may be going too far with this. Managed to break my fall with a uh, a barrier, but, um, you know, I woke up, I don't know, what day is it? Uh, Finas, Hulda informs. Yep, yep, uh, woke up the next day, mid-morning, lying in a kind of me-shaped crater. I finish. You know, actually, that's not that far from the truth. I was attacked by a mage, that did take me by surprise, and I did wake up in a me-shaped crater. Just not quite so clear on the timeline. <sighs> Remember when I, w said when, uh, when I said I wanted to be a knight? Arthur pipes up. I changed my mind. He nods resolutely. <laughs> uh, smart boy, I scoff. <sighs> I should have stayed a merchant like my dad. Now, uh, you know, she's around. I bluff. Given the context, I can only assume that Morgana has indeed taken over Camelot. I suppose it could be some other her they refer to, though. They weren't... <coughs> they weren't, um... Nearby, were they? Mm, um... No, what... I don't think so. What's the nearest village? Yabby? Ornard? Uh, Yabby's just down the path, yeah. Wow. No, I was, um, all the way down by, um, Old Canning when I ran into... Well, them. Must have been thrown miles somehow, like a big, half-baked, rather unhappy bird, I scoff. Does that happen often? Hulda asks as she stirs a pot of swede. I've offered to treat everyone to a bit of my ground pepper that, that I have in my kit, so everyone has naturally decided to have a rather early breakfast, or late dinner, I'm not quite sure, and have some swede and cured goat with me. Honestly, I wish I could say no, but yeah, actually, no, that does happen um, relatively often. Th that's why they send me on scouting missions, of course. I'm rather good at um, surviving being blown up, I scoff. Cherry snorts a little with laughter. Her mother gives her a harsh glance when she thinks I won't notice. I'm um, not great at the um, not getting blown up in the first place, but um, I am working on it. I give Cherry a cheeky wink when I think her mother isn't looking. So, you're the knight of not getting blown up, then? Cherry smirks. She receives several harsh glares. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. Um, I mean, well, not, not all of us can be the best swordsman or, or the strongest spear in the land or, or the greatest hunter. Me? I'm the best at not freaking dying. That's what I've got. I scoff. It's absolutely true. I'm not a bad shot with a bow, as... Not as good as, you know, any one of the bowmen that I have manning my walls. But, um, possible. I hit a deer once. Percival had to track it and finish it for me. But, um, you know. Where I really shine, though, is, um, basically just not staying down when I get hit. Even after my barriers fall and my bones are broken, I'll keep on getting up. 
it's uh my philosophy i suppose or or nature i guess um if someone's going to try and kill me well they'd better not have planned anything that day because i'm going to be taking up a lot of their time huh the room isn't exactly sure about any of this do people try and kill you often Hulda asks rather concerned um two kings one queen three dragons my father that time uh knights soldiers bandits a couple of giants um there was this very unhappy group of ogres at one time i was um separated from my comrades not the best week by the go no no i i definitely do not want to be a knight arthur confirms well of course the idea isn't to go around you know picking fights for example, those ogres, um, an ogre's favourite food is, you know, human, um, preferably babies, children, women. Ugh. That, that's true. I've heard rumours, but the youngest boy nearly whimpers from a nearby window, which he has been keeping a watch out. Uh, yeah, but, okay, so here's the thing about ogres. They're, they're horrible, but, um, for some reason, only one in about... 50 of them, maybe, is actually what you'd call intelligent, you know? The intelligent ones always have a third eye, by the way, uh, right here. I point to the centre of my forehead. They usually don't leave their lairs, though, so, um, they just tell the others what to do instead, so, anyway, if you're ever, and this works, by the way, I swear, I swear to ev I swear to every god, this actually works. It's, it's amazing. If there's ever a, if there's ever an ogre looking to eat you, just tell them that you saw a group of half-naked virgin women carrying babies running in the opposite direction. <laughs> You're kidding. Freddy is not convinced. I'm actually not. The um, We were reporting to a village that had been attacked the night before, and there was a group of four of them. Um, massive, hulking, not particularly aesthetically pleasing. So, um, one of my men suggests, you know, why not try to fool them? I mean, if it works, four less ogres to worry about, and then if it doesn't, then, well, we were already going to have to fight them. So, um, we're in cover, ready to ambush them, and he cups his mouth, so it sounds a bit like an echo, I guess, and yells, Look, there are a dozen naked virgin women bathing in the forest over there. Ha! Freddy cracks up. <sighs> you can't be serious. Hulda is not impressed. I, I, I absolutely swear this this is true. He spent the entire ride convincing us to let him try to... <sighs> now, no, no, Hulda sighs, extracting the swede from the boiling water. As much as I wish that would work, as, lo as lovely as it would be to be able to protect yourself from something so hateful in such a simple way, please tell me that's not true. I'm pretty sure, by the way, I'm pretty sure you could distract any human men in exactly the same way. I scoff. In fact, I'm, in fact, I would be willing to bet if you three, you three, were out in a field and someone ran up and yelled something about women bathing in a stream nearby, you'd be out there in a flash. Uh, the two sons avert their eyes. Why, I haven't <coughs> the slightest idea of what you're talking about, sir. Freddy says, straightening himself up and speaking in a much clearer accent. <laughs> I love it. Is that right? Hulda rolls her eyes from over at the stove as Cherry sniggers to herself. <sighs> Here you are, Sir Arthur. Hulda lays down a bowl for each of us of boiled swede and goat. The most basic of meals, but absolutely welcome after, well, everything. Here. She hands Frederick his bowl harshly. We've been having a bit of fun at Frederick's expense for a while now, but all in good fun. And I p did promise a little bit of... I fetch my kit and draw from it a small silver case. Pepper! I announce. All sitting around the table instantly sit up like trained dogs, demonstrating how good they are. They all stare at the little packet. I was intending to be generous, but, um, it seems I'm kind of just showing off. Uh, Arthur inhales a long wheeze at the sight of it. You don't want to inhale this stuff, by the way, I warn. 
Cherry reaches over and pushes his chin up, shutting his mouth for him. Is that... Freddy clears his throat as I open the case, revealing the finely ground black powder. Is that really worth... What, a bunch of silvers the ounce? He asks. Um, couple of silvers an ounce? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know what? I'm actually not sure. I've never had much of a hand in, um, luxury goods tradings, but, um, it's expensive as hell, I know that much. So what you do, um, I close the case before demonstrating, in case anyone sneezes. So you want to mash up your swede, um, a bit of salt, just a, just a touch, and then just a little pinch. About that much is fine. I sprinkle a bit of ground pepper on the swede and goat. See, pepper just makes things, um, a little less dull. I shrug as they each try the swede. They take a moment each. I mean, it doesn't exactly make everything suddenly amazing. It is better, Holder admits. Swede is legendarily dull, and dried goat isn't much better. It looks as though they had all rather expected more. I mean, it's Swede. Not to, you know, but... Arthur attempts to not insult his mother's cooking. In her defence, she didn't have much to work with. Yeah, it just makes things a little less... You know... It makes things better, basically. Things aren't suddenly ambrosia, but... Mm, tastes like boiled Swede. Holder nods. <sighs> now that she's the one that's saying it, everyone seems to agree. Yeah, Freddy isn't incredibly enthused either. I mean, if you got money for it, he nods. I'd definitely rather have it than not, he agrees. And of course, once all the nobles sort started getting, you know, and putting pepper on everything, then, well, I think it's less paying so much for the pepper itself, more paying so much because you don't want to not have pepper. Ah, uh, right, no, that makes sense, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep, 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 yep. Everyone seems to agree, and we begin tucking in properly. You... Cherry, who has been somewhat distracted for some time, prods her swede while absent in thought. Hmm. She seems to reconsider after her family gives her a cautioning look. I believe they're still worried that I might, um, claim her. Back in the day, as we passed through villages, families would often try and thrust their daughters upon us, figuring that a woman being the plaything of higher nobles would be better than a life out in the sticks where one is likely to be taken by bandits. These people do not seem to share this opinion. Cherry here is probably around 16 years of age, and it's rather strange to see a girl of her age not married by now. She is quite lovely, quite tall, elegant figure and good skin, but she also seems to have been working in the fields with her family and looks quite fit as well. Exactly the kind of young woman that, well, a local lord would either pursue or simply abduct. I'm sure that's exactly what they're thinking I'll do if I somehow take a fancy to her. Pridwin, she says, meeting my eyes directly. The others around the table glare harshly at her. You called it... Pridwin, she observes. Cherry, her father warns her in a serious tone. It's all right, it's all right, I assure her family. Young Arthur lays his hands on the sword. I'm not here to pillage any young women, I assure them. They do not, however, seem convinced. Go on, Cherry. I nod to her. Now, s now Sir Arthur, our, our dear Cherry has a rather active imagination. Hulda attempts to excuse her in the same way that I've heard families do for many women that dare to speak their minds. When I was little, Cherry maintains eye contact directly. Back when things weren't so bad, the elders in the village would tell us stories, she continues, ignoring her family. Cherry, now, her father stands, about before Camelot fell. Her words are resolute. I feel every muscle in my body begin to tense. About before it fell, Fifteen years ago. That is the end of part one of Knights of the Round Table. Thank you for listening. I do hope you found it entertaining.
If you would like to support the channel, please like and or subscribe, or if you'd like to become a patron, please do head over to Nobody of Particular Significance on Patreon. I would absolutely love to have you. A bit of an afterword, though. As stated in the introduction, the main plotline of the story will mostly act as a framework, so that it might introduce you to various knights and explore each of their own character arcs individually. While this and the next chapter will be from perf the perspective of Arthur and serve to establish the state of the world in which the story takes place, chapter 3 will be the start of the tale of Sir Gareth and will take place from her point of view. Thank you and I hope to see you again.